Welcome to the ninth video in the Just In Case mini series, sponsored by Quality Equality, an organization development firm that based in Oxford, United Kingdom. And my name is Mei Yan Chung Judge, and I'm the director of um, Q&E. This mini series is called Just In Case. It's just in case you need to be reminded of something, just in case you didn't know about something, just in case that you want to refresh your memory and just in case you want to know a topic better. And today is just in case you need to know a topic better. A fantastic methodology, a fantastic paradigm, and a way of being called appreciative inquiry. Our contributor today is David, a positive transformation leader with over 25 years of experience in designing and leading successful OD and change, not just with AI, but predominantly with the AI methodology and, and paradigm. So he, today he will share with us the basic of appreciative inquiry and how that methodology and embodiment can help us lead and serve our clients even at this particular time, which is crisis. Uh, David um, has just published a book with two colleagues. And in that particular book that he actually present a very exciting new model of appreciative inquiry, the name of the book and the link are presented at the end of the video. So thank you for offering your time and wisdom to share with us about your thinking in this area, both combining the old and the new and with very clear application. So over to you, David. Thank you, Mian, for inviting me here. I'm delighted to speak to you all about Appreciative Inquiry and in particular about how to use it in times of crisis. I've been working and living and playing with Appreciative Inquiry very intensely over the past 14 years. And today I hope to share with you some new insight about Appreciative Inquiry in times of crisis. But before we go there, let's talk a little bit about what is Appreciative Inquiry so that we all understand it. Appreciative Inquiry is not new. It's been around for more than 30 years. And yet somehow, every time I bring it into a conversation with a new client or a new person, they find it very refreshing. It brings new insight, things they haven't thought about before. So what is it? To start, I'm going to introduce you a quote by Marcel Proust that I feel actually really represents what Appreciative Inquiry does. Marcel Proust said, the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscape, but in having new eyes. To me, Appreciative Inquiry offers exactly that. It doesn't require you to look sideways or elsewhere. It's inviting you to look at exactly the same situation you're facing, but offers you new eyes. So that is Marcel Proust's explanation of how you, uh, what is appreciative inquiry. But I also have another explanation, which might make sense to you. Personally, I've always been told that in order to make good decisions, I need to have a better grasp of my reality. That might actually be familiar to you as well. We've all been taught that we need to understand our reality in full so that we can make good decisions. The trouble with that is that we all create a story in our mind about our reality. And that story is influenced by a lot of conversations that we're having, by the media that we're absorbing, by the data we collect. All of that creates a story in our mind of what is our reality. The challenge with that is that story is highly influenced by deficit conversation and by challenging stories. We hear a lot about the problems we have, the challenges, the complaints, the issues we're facing, the challenges we need to mitigate, the performance issues. All of that is part of our reality. What we don't hear enough or pay attention to at the same level is everything that is going well in our reality. All the resources we have, the strengths we have, everything that is still possible, all of that is still part of our reality. And somehow we underplay it. We don't pay the same attention or forensic interest 
in those parts. So my argument to you is really, if you want to make better decisions, make sure you include that in your reality, in your story of, of the reality. And Appreciative Inquiry offers you a very accessible way to bring that part of the reality into conversation. So Appreciative Inquiry is, uh, is a strength-based approach to change, to learning, to development. Uh, it's not the only one. It's the most. Uh, it, it's the one that has been around for the longest. But there are other approaches. One is called positive deviance. That's the youngest one, and there's also solution focused coaching. They're all bringing the same kind of mindset, but the actual practice is slightly different. There is a lot of theory, a lot of research behind it. Areas, different areas of research. For example, positive psychology, neuroscience, complexity science positive organizational scholarship, and dialogical D. All of that provides the theoretical basis of what we do in those practices. Now, I'm personally much more of a practitioner, uh, and what I'd like to provide you today is more practice level. So let's talk about some of the main ideas of appreciative inquiry. The main ideas are by shifting our attention to three parts the best of the past, the best of the present or what is possible in the present, and the most inspiring future that we want. By shifting our attention to these three elements, we actually help release a lot of confidence, energy, new ideas, and the ability to move forward in an easier way. These ideas are all common across the different strength-based approaches. Speaking about appreciative inquiry specifically, appreciative inquiry is the search, the inquiry into our successes, into our strengths. When we do that, we end up releasing energy and creating energy for change. Now, within appreciative inquiry, there is a process, well-known process, the four or five Ds. But for me, what it does really, it's offering us a different lens to looking at our situations. And it's more of a philosophy, a way of living and being in this world, a way of interacting with people and situations. Some of the key ideas on Appreciative Inquiry are what we focus on will grow. So you'll get more of whatever you focus on, positive or negative. Second idea, in every situation, however difficult, something works well. So let's use that and learn from it and build on that. The third idea is that it's always easier to grow out of what you already have rather than out of what you don't have. Fourth idea is change begins immediately with the first question you ask. So you have to be very choiceful about those questions. And finally, people teams, organizations move in the direction of the questions they ask, the stories they tell, and the images they hold of the possible future. You might ask yourself, how does it all work? So let me take you through the flow of it. What you ask about will determine what you find. If you ask about your problems and challenges and issues, you will find them. That is obvious. If you ask about what is possible, the strengths, the resources, the exceptional, exceptionally positive cases, you will find them too. Why is that important? It is important because what you find will determine how you talk and what conversations you're having. Why is that important? The conversations you're having will determine what you see as possible in your future. And finally, why is that important? It's important because what you see as possible for your future will determine what you actually achieve. And it works both ways. It works if you start from an inquiry into the problem and challenges, or if you start from inquiry into what is working. There's a lot you can do with a Pristine Inquiry. Uh, it's been done on personal issues, on work issues, on organizational or systemic issues. It can work at all levels of system from your own self system, working with another person, working with a group, multiple groups, sometimes with whole organizations, or even with multiple organizations and countries. 
All of that is possible and has been done. So just to summarize what a Pishtimkai, a Pishtimkai is a way of asking questions and having generative conversations around what works or has worked, what gives life to any situation, and when does a, an individual, a team, or a whole organization experience themselves at their best. And these type of conversations can be done or held no matter how challenging or difficult or dysfunctional a situation may seem to be. And what happens is when you have them, they always result in some useful discoveries that were previously not taken into any consideration. So now that we know about appreciative inquiry and understand a little bit about the logic of how it works, um, let's talk about appreciative inquiry in the context of a crisis, because we are going through a crisis at the moment, and you might also go through other crises in the future. So it might be useful to think about appreciative inquiry in that context. And most people do not necessarily see the immediate link between appreciative inquiry and dealing with the crisis, because in their mind, it tends to focus only on strengths, on highest moments, on the best aspirations you have, and they're not very easy to connect to when you're in the middle of a crisis. So first of all, I'd like to refer to uh, an article that David Cooper had recently released, which reminds us that appreciative inquiry is not just about those wonderful moments that we experience, it's actually an inquiry into what gives life in any situation both the extraordinary situations of our lives and our work, but also the ordinary, the daily mundane situations. What gives life to them? What enables us to go through those moments and actually continue with our life and our work? And finally, there is also something that gives life in our tragic moments, in our most difficult challenges. Something helps us go through those moments, both at work and at life in general. And that is the inquiry we're doing. We're inquiring into what gives life. So that was David Cooperwriter's reminder. In my book, my recent book, together with two other colleagues, Claire Lustig and Bernard uh, Tonic, we talk about how to tap into the full power of appreciative inquiry. And in there, we're introducing a new model, a new framework to look at appreciative inquiry which we hope will take you into a much deeper level of uh, practicing and being with a Christian guy. The model we call is the five Ps, and it talks about five different layers of appreciative inquiry. Most of us, most people who have been trained or learned about appreciative inquiry or played with it, are aware of the process level, the process of appreciative inquiry, most notably the five Ds. Some of you may have tried another layer, which we call the parts and pieces. That means you may have tried an AI interview or some questions, or maybe some tool that uses appreciative inquiry. The other levels that are in appreciative inquiry and are worth paying attention to are the principles, which I will talk about in a few minutes. And then we go much deeper, the paradigm of thinking on which appreciative inquiry is sitting on and your presence, your own appreciative presence. Now, if you really want to tap into the full power of appreciative inquiry, you can play and float at all of these levels, not just at a given process. In our model, we look at the two layers of process and parts and pieces as being doing AI. And the two deeper levels of the paradigms and the presence are being AI. The level of principles, operating with the AI principles, is really the bridge between doing and being appreciative inquiry. So let's talk about the appreciative inquiry principles uh, and how you might use them through a crisis. There are six most commonly known principles for appreciative inquiry, and they are social construction, poetic, wholeness, positive, some people call it the generative, simultaneity and anticipatory. 
Now, I'm going to refer to some of my notes to help you understand each one of them and how you might use them in crisis. So, for example, social construction, what does it mean? It means that we make meaning through conversations. We make meaning of our reality through conversations, either with ourselves or with each other. And that helps us create a certain story of that crisis. So when we turn into using it in any particular crisis, what conversations are you currently having about this crisis? Pay attention to that. And what other conversations could you have? With whom? The poetic principle that goes hand in hand with the social construction tells us that stories are always told about any reality. And like any, like any poem or a book or any scenery, you can interpret that situation in multiple ways, almost millions of different ways. So what matters to the choices we make is our interpretation of that story or that reality. So turning back to our crisis situation, what choices have you made in how you made sense of that crisis? What stories have you paid more attention to? And what other stories have you paid less attention to? And of all of these stories, which one of these stories could actually generate some fresh thinking for you or new ideas or new energy to help you through that crisis? The next principle I'd like to talk about is the wholeness principle. What it says to us is that better decisions and greater progress happens when you involve all the people that are relevant to any situation. You bring them into the discussion. So if you're thinking of your current crisis, who are you currently talking to on this crisis? And who else can you invite to that conversation? And whose thoughts, preferences, opinions really must be heard? How can you enable that as a leader? The positive or the generative principle? Well, I think that's probably the most easiest to understand when you think about a Christian guy. You know that it is choosing the positive or the generative position. However, what it actually means is that any situation, any person, any team, any organization have a positive core in them. And what we are seeking to do is to tap into that positive core, activate it, build on it, and move forward from that positive core. So when you think about your crisis, how have you been able to go through it so far? What made it possible for you? You are in the middle of it. What made it possible for you to arrive up to today, up to now? And amidst everything that is going wrong in this crisis and everything that is challenging you, who is doing something exceptional, something different, something that might actually help find a new way forward? And if they are doing it, how are they doing it? Can you inquire into, can you look deeply as deeper as you look into what is going wrong. The next principle is the simultaneity principle. It's quite a mouthful <laughs> as a word, simultaneity. What it means is that change happens as soon as you ask a question. There is a close link between asking a question, inquiring into something, and actually generating a question. And the link is because the minute you ask a question, you're turning people's attention or even your own attention to the direction of that question. That means that you have to be very choiceful and very aware of what questions you're asking. So let's talk about the crisis. As, as you go through this crisis, what have you been asking people about it? And what data have you been collecting? What other data can you collect? What other stories can you ask about? And the last principle is the principle called, which is called the anticipatory. 
That means that people, uh, their behavior, the decisions they take will be driven by the images they see of the future and what might be possible for them. And that is particularly important at times of crisis because in times of crisis, people tend to imagine the worst about the future. They imagine that everything will be destroyed or die or will be eliminated. And if you help them imagine a different possibility, something that is more generative, something that is more positive about the future, it will help them carry through that crisis and move forward. So let's think about the images of the possible future that you are carrying or holding yourself and also the people that you are talking to. What images of the future are they carrying and are they inspiring to you and others? And if they're not, what alternative images of the future can you help generate? That was about leading through crisis using the principles, which for me is much deeper than taking any particular process with the British TV Choir. So these were the six principles behind the British TV Inquiry and some sample questions you could use, but maybe I can bring it further to life for you by sharing a story I've experienced of a leadership in crisis using a British TV Inquiry. A few years ago, I was invited by a client who is a manager of several care homes to work with one of the care homes she was supervising. This was a large care home, and unfortunately, a few weeks earlier, it was rated a very poor rating by the authorities. There was a lot of pressure on that care home and everyone felt quite down because of the rating and because of the uh, lack of support from the leadership. I came in for a first visit with the management team, the local management team on site. And very quickly, I noticed that everyone was sharing stories and examples of how bad the situation was, how nobody was doing the work they should do correctly and how they're going to go even further and possibly even face the threat of closure. This is basically an example of how a story of the situation is socially constructed by a group of people and actually can influence where they are going to go in the future. So what I really wanted them to start working on and change possibly is the vision of the future and the story they're telling about it which is the anticipatory principle. We started working on the question, what do you want to have here in this care home? At first it was, we don't want to get this bad rating again, which is still avoiding something. We then continued working on that question and what I got from them was, we want to significantly improve the rating and show that we are worth it. So I've asked continuous questions about what would it look like when you get a better rating here? What would this place look like and feel like when the rating is higher? And slowly and surely examples of what would be different were actually coming from this management team. This was the beginning of a journey of crafting and changing the story of what could happen in the future. And straight away I could see the impact of the questions I was asking. This is a simultaneity principle. It took only a few minutes before the story started shifting. But of course, the job was not done in one conversation. We continued working with them over several months. And every time we met, we continued to co-create a story of success in this care home. And in fact, I was encouraging the management team to also reach out and involve in the conversation the rest of the organization the people who were reporting, the customers, everyone who was staying in the care home. This is an example of how the wholeness principle came to place in shaping and engaging the whole system in what success could look like. After eight months of conversations and continuous work and improvement, and many of these conversations were focused on identifying what was already working in the care home, and what could be built on what was working, which is, of course, the positive principle. After eight months, the rating agency came back and improved the rating to the rating they were hoping to get. In fact, they were told that apart from two minor items on the list, they probably would have gotten an outstanding rating. 
This, of course, was a cause for celebration and relief in the care home. And at the same time, it was a fantastic base to continue building a story of further success in the future. So we had another conversation with this team and continued to inquire into what was working so well, what enabled the success of the turnaround, and how could all of this help in continuous improvement and shifting of a story of success for this cow. Of course, these stories required a lot of work, but stories and uh, the vision you hold for the future actually really are powerful in shifting what you actually do day to day to achieve that vision. I hope this example was helpful in understanding how working with the principles on a regular basis can help shift a situation from crisis to success. The next part that I'd like to talk about is the presence, which for me is the actual deepest level you can work with appreciative inquiry. It's really being appreciative inquiry. And in our book, we've actually created a certain model to bring to light some of the ingredients of an appreciative presence. And there are three ingredients. One is basically the ability to create an inclusive and generative space. The second one is sensing appreciatively and with curiosity. And the third one is the ability to steer through the emergence of new ideas in an appreciative way. These are the three ingredients of the appreciative presence. And what I'd like to do now is to apply them to times of crisis. So let's start with creating a generative and inclusive space for yourself first and then others. What do you know? What can you do? What resources do you have? These are questions that you tend to forget about when you're in the middle of a crisis. And now that you know what you can do or what you know or what is available to you, how can you also open up and welcome what others know, can do or have? And how do you bring all of that into your awareness? That was the first part, the creating of a generative space. The second part is the ability to sense appreciatively with curiosity. That invites us, especially in times of crisis, to think about, reflect and notice what energizes us and others. Where can you spot any sparks of hope, of life, of energy or any strengths around you? It's really paying attention and spotting them. And also paying attention to what are you and others are curious about. All of these are sensing the energy that exists in a system or in a situation. And finally, now that you've created a space, a generative space, and you are able to uh, sense with curiosity, there is also the element of steering, steering through the emergence in an appreciative way. And that means that you pay attention to what keeps you grounded, or centered, even if you are in uncertainty? How can you adopt a, a stand or a position of possibility as you make sense of everything you and other are experiencing? What helps you recenter on a generative space or mindset? Because like you, I am too, sometimes in the middle of a crisis, I forget all of the appreciative stuff and I'm really burdened by the trouble and challenges that I'm facing. What helps you recenter in those moments and reactivate your appreciative presence? That's worth paying attention to and using actively. And finally, paying attention to and actively shining a light or igniting or, or further amplifying those positive sparks you've sensed earlier. That is really the use of self or, or the appreciative presence in times of crisis.
So we have spoken about what is a Prestige Inquiry, how does it work? We also talked about how to work with it at a deeper level from the principles or the presence. Now I'd like to turn back to you and offer you a few basic starting possibilities for conversations that you could have in the middle of your crisis. So next time when you find yourself in a conversation, maybe try asking some of the following questions. What were your better moments in this period of crisis? Not necessarily great moments, but better moments. And what specifically made them better for you? Thinking about the lockdown that we are facing right now, none of us chose to it. But even if we didn't choose it, what do you appreciate about it? And what did it enable you to do, to be, or even to discover that you wouldn't otherwise have been? What would you like to keep from this period? I can imagine that there are many things you would want to forget about. But what would you like to keep from this period? What were you able to achieve despite the situation? How? What or who helped you achieve that? What can you do now? Really, what you can you do now? And who else around you is able to do remarkable things, despite everything that is going on? What strengths, what resources are easily available and can be tapped on around you? These are just some basic questions you can ask anyone, no matter how difficult a crisis they are facing. So what I hope is that through this webinar, you are able to understand, have a better understanding of what is appreciative inquiry and its depth or richness or potential, especially in times of crisis. If you already knew about appreciative inquiry or have been working with it, that you can and are inspired to go further and deeper with it. I hope that you'll be able to discover and build upon everything that gives life in your situations, especially if it is a crisis situation. And finally, that through your appreciative presence and inquiry, you will be able to help people and organizations through the, their own reality of crisis and help them move forward. Thank you. Thank you for listening. On behalf of everyone, thank you, David, for sharing your thinking and development of the appreciative inquiry model. The, original one and your new one. I'm grateful for you taking the time to give us this particular lens to really navigate, help us to navigate through crisis. And I particularly like those practical questions um, that you give us at the end. So, so useful. And so thank you. And if all of you like to contact David to continue this conversation, his email along with who he is and the various links he has offered are in the description of the video at the end. So David, a big thank you again uh, for taking this time to share. And may we all practice our appreciative presence in time like this. Go well, go strong, stay safe.